Clarence is, uh, among other things, is an alumni of the Jazz Studies program here at the University of New Orleans. But he's uh, an amazing musician. He's got perfect pitch, perfect time, <laughs> perfect sense of spirituality and music, and uh, just just an all-around great person. And uh, I'm going to let him introduce everyone else, uh, even though I've played with these guys before. But how about a hand for Clarence Johnson III? Thank you. All right, so. Uh, on bass, uh, he's played with everybody from Dr. John, Terrence Blanchard, uh, and his um, electric, uh, what, what was it called? E-collective. E -collective. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Donna Ramsey on the bass. <laughs> and a uh, longtime friend of mine from the Washington, D.C. area. He spent some time down here uh, in New Orleans through the United States uh, Navy Band and the Steel Band of the United States Navy back in uh, the mid-90s. And uh, he moved back to uh, the D.C. area to, uh, to continue his service. And uh, he's recently retired, and now he's just going around playing music and sharing his gift, and he came back to uh, hang out with us today. Uh, none other than Leon Alexander, Jr. Yeah. So this is the, uh, uh, it's gonna be pretty, uh, uh, percussion bass, but it's going to carry and uh, have messages for all musicians. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get things started with uh, an arrangement of a tune that we like to do that kind of encompasses what we're going to talk about, which is uh, changing different uh, zones and being able to adapt to various styles and genres uh, easily. Uh, and this is going to be an example of that. Uh, we're going to start off with a, a song that you're going to recognize as All Blues by uh, Mr. Miles Davis. Exception. We're not doing it in 3 4. We're going to do it in a totally different style and a totally different time signature.
Next thing we'll do is talk about a little bit of the uh, Brazilian element, and uh, we'll perform, kind of demonstrate that with George Duke too, uh, called Brazilian Sugar. You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, I guess as a as a drummer and percussionist, the one thing that I all, we always talk about when we hear when somebody says, "Oh, let's play a Latin," right? Well, what does that mean, right? To play a Latin, right? That's like coming and saying. Oh, I want you to play something American. What is that, right? It's actually sort of disrespectful and ignorant, right? Because the Latin can kind of encompass a whole bunch of countries, right? Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Venezuela, all these things. And they all have their own little thing that Africans, West Africans brought to each place, right? Um, I did my study in at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music in Ohio. That's where I got my undergraduate degree. And uh, what was interesting about there was my first two years, I had the great Donald Byrd there, was there teaching uh, while the other professor was on sabbatical. So he was really big, besides getting the basic classical training, but he was really big on all of us being able to appreciate all these different styles of music, all the different styles of jazz, what we call jazz, Latin jazz, Afro jazz, all of that, and he made sure that we were exposed to all of that with who he brought in on trips that we made. So while I was at Oakland, I got to go to West Africa. I got to go to Brazil. I actually got to go to Cuba. Um, I spent a, a, almost a year in Brazil and, uh, and hanging out in what they call the Samba schools and all of that. So uh, my, my what I bring as a drummer and percussionist comes from all of those influence. Also, you know, European bass with memorimba, va, everything, you know. Um, but, so that's the biggest thing. So when we talk about Latin music, you gotta say, what country are you dealing with? What, what style of music are you dealing with? And you should make yourself verse and study and all of that. Because they all have their, their own little specific things. So we're just talking about uh, Brazilian or samba or bossa nova. Um, and so to make it short, because I can go on forever, um, there's a rhythm called Partido Alto, right? Um, you might have heard, uh, right? And then you have the Bossa Nova clock, right? Brazilian music is based off what we call Partido Alto. And actually the, the rhythm they play, you hear it all in this. of like the key to a lot of Brazilian music, right? You can go to a place called Bahia, the state of Bahia, and that's where the West African influence is very, very strong in Brazil. And you will hear that basic rhythm a whole lot in between different instruments. Um, so, right, really comes from that, right? So when we're talking about Brazilian music and the rhythms, it's coming from that, that pattern, it's sort of one of the big keys, okay? So I just want to talk about that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, we're going to demonstrate that. Like I said, uh, a lot of uh, uh, songs came and a lot of jazz standards came from uh, that part of the world. Not just jazz standards, but all types of great music. Uh, Antonio Jobim, and all the way to the contemporary Sergio Mendez, and Carlos Malta. Uh, we're going to do something uh, for the late, great George Duke. Uh, one of his albums back in the 70s was called Resilient Love Affair. And most musicians have that same thing happen to them, especially when you have a chance to actually visit that place in your uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, and like, like I said before, this is something of his entitled Brazilian Sugar. And now I'm going to do it for you right now.
Partido Alto yeah. Club. Mm -hmm. Can you do that two different ways too? Like yes. start on three? So right. What, yeah. you know, so how do you know, you know, because like in, we talk about whether it's a 3 2 club or a 2 Right. Two, what two I do, like, yeah, typically, kind of, kind of like what happened when you play with like Afro Cuban man, sometimes they start flighting over where the club is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. but a lot of times what I'll do is. I will try to match up with whether the, with the guitar player is doing that or the piano player is doing that. And if, if they're not looking at me or not connecting, I'll just follow where they are. I'll try to feel where they're, they're laying the clave and match up with them, right? Sometimes they'll be listening to me and they'll match up with me. But if they're not, I just always try my best to match up with that individual to make sure that the clave is matching, yeah. you know, that we're not clashing. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, don't trust me though. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is a good time. Do we uh, have any other questions? Well, we can take some a couple of questions now. We'll take, take a few more at the end if we have any questions now. Um, yeah, I like I like when, when you when you were taking a solo on the last tune, mm -hmm. yeah. the way you were sort of playing in the cracks. Can you talk a little bit about that? The way you were stretching like, the time. Right, right. That so, was really, yeah. so you know, there's there's time and then there's time outside of the time, right? And what, what happens is, you know, you're trying to sort of fill in the holes. Uh, with, I guess I'll, I'll just polyrhythms, right? And for example, when you walk down the street, you, you're, you're playing polyrhythms all the time, right? And when I play, I, I try to feel and hear all those different things going on within the time, whatever's going on. There's always different rhythms, fives, sixes, three, four, three against four is always going on. And what I try to do in my playing, or when I hear it, is, is uh, filling those cracks with some of those polyrhythms. I think it makes it a little interesting. And sometimes the other musicians catch it, if you heard that. Sometimes he was playing against the beat. Um, and he would match or I would match, but that's what I'm trying to do all the time. So I actually, it's not something that like you study playing rudiments or something, you know, it's something that you have to feel also, your feel, you have to feel it within you as well, right? You practice playing three against four and all these different things, but you also have to take it out of the time because time stretches, right? You don't want to play like you're in a studio all the time, like you're playing with a click, you know, but you want to stretch the time a little bit. So that's what I'm constantly trying to do. Sometimes I make it and sometimes I don't, quite honestly. But that, that's the attempt to play in those cracks and play something interesting, but play something that doesn't take away from anyone and what they're doing. So. Hey Clarence, yeah. you, I mean, you know, Saxophone is not known as being a rhythmic instrument, but when I play with you, I feel like I'm playing with a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how did you develop that sense on, on your instrument I mean, in terms of like just articulating rhythm like that, you know? Uh, and it's actually to kind of piggyback what, what Leon was saying. Uh, the direct answer to that particular question is, uh, I'm pretty much a drummer trapped in the saxophone's body. <laughs> I actually started out on drums when I was like four years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, my parents, my dad bought this nice, uh, you know, drum set with, uh, for me. And it was great. But at the same time, he also got me a tool kit. And, you know, in the mind of a four-year-old, it, it's, it's a little interesting what can come about when you combine a tool kit with a drum set. <laughs> So he came in the room one day and saw my little four-year-old creation with a tool kit and, uh, that, that included screwdrivers and hammers and he saw busted heads all over the world and <laughs> put the drums away and never came back down from the uh, attic and a couple of years later, I had a saxophone in my hand. So <laughs> that's kind of how, so I, you know, I think it has something to do, uh, you know, Vidak always speaks about this. It has something to do with growing up here, uh, Johnny Vidak, growing up here in New Orleans, being such a rhythmic town. Uh, I mean, this is one of the, uh, the centers of, 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 of you know, African congregation uh, of, of, of what, what the uh, slave uh, transport uh, years ago back in Congo Square. Uh, so I mean, all of that influence has a lot to do 
with, I think, what kind of separates uh, New Orleans musicians and musicians that hang out in New Orleans. So, I mean, it just has, it's such a rhythmic town. Uh, I think it has, it has to do with being below sea level, all of those funny little elements uh, that, that contribute to it. And to further that point, what Leon was saying, as far as being able to uh, manipulate time, a lot of times when we're studying improvisation, uh, particularly uh, in, in college courses, uh, you know, they tell you to uh, transcribe, which is brilliant. That's the, the way to learn the language. Uh, and then you gotta get to a point to where you become a total musician to where you kind of break free of strigid eighth note rhythms uh, that you commonly hear over a four four swing. And that's when you can really start to have some fun when you're stretching time, manipulating time, studying all of these different types of rhythms, uh, you know, from from Brazil, from Africa, uh, and, and uh, other parts of the world. And when you combine that with the knowledge that you're already studying with theory, it, it, it kind of loosens you up. I liken it to how Wayne Shorter describes it. I mean, he's not when he's playing, he's not think of thinking necessarily of um, you know the scale that you learn or the, the, the uh, modes that go with this chord but he's trying to imitate life. And a lot of times, like Leon was saying, when you walk, life doesn't have a, uh, a set time signature. So when you can kind of do those against uh, meters and counter rhythms and polyrhythms within the same tune or the same idea, that's when you can be, become truly free and that's when your creative senses can really uh, go to new heights. So, man. As much rhythm and, 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 and things that you can expose yourself to, that's really what, what, what it uh, will what, what it get you to the, to the next level. So did you expose yourself to rhythm through records or just playing with good players? or uh... Uh, Playing with good players. Uh, <laughs> when I was maybe around your guys' age, which was only like a couple of years ago, <laughs> uh, you know, I was you know, just getting into college. I mean, I, I was, you know, you get a little intimidated, but you get up the nerve to call. If you get a little gig at this week, you get up the nerve to call the Steve Mazikowski to come play with you. It's like, wow, man, I call Steve. And then he actually said yes. <laughs> and he came and played with me with, with a little gig at Loyola. So the thing I like to look at it is, if you get a chance to surround yourself with the best, uh, whether it's uh, the legends that are on the current scene, or your peers around you that are doing some good things, that's going to do nothing but uh, uh, but 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 uh, challenge you and make you better. For a lot for a long time, uh, I got musicians around me to where the band was. I was the worst player in the band. I never forget that. As a matter of fact, and then that leads to people saying, "Well, you know, you your name gets passed on to other people." I never I, I never forget the first time I stepped on stage. Uh, with Henry Butler, the late great Henry Butler. Mm -hmm. And it was like a uh, awakening like I would never thought it would be. You know, usually when you go to a club and you got your acts and they ask you to sit in, you know, they stop the tune and they announce, well, so-and-so's in the audience, we'd like to see if he has his horn to come up and uh, play a couple of songs with us if you wouldn't mind. You know, be a real nice about it, you know. Not, not. So, Henry Butler was in the middle of uh, this fast Afro-Cuban kind of modal thing, and it was intense. And all of a sudden, he, he grabs the mic while he's playing, Clarence Johnson. <laughs> so I was summoned. I was not invited. I was summoned to the stage. I mean, with that kind of thing, and he and he did it again. He did like two, three times. Like God. I guess I better get my horn out and get on down there. But being in that kind of situation, uh, with all of that music going on, it, it rubs up on you. If you take advantage of you hang out with those guys, uh, listening, uh, listening to them. And the other thing that I did that really was cool, as listening to people, saxophonists transcribing saxophones. I didn't just transcribe and listen to saxophone players. I listened to bass players. I transcribed a lot of bass players, uh, electric bass players. I, I, I got fascinated with different types of drummers. I listened to uh, guitar lines and just trying to figure that out. And then I stretched it well, well beyond instruments. I started trying to listen to and transcribe R2D2, things like that. You know, like, <laughs> from Star Wars. And it's kind of nice. <laughs> so that's kind of the, 
set the standard for going down that path of getting completely free to create and not necessarily being confined to the limitations of the instrument. That's pretty much, yeah. How yeah. many people have heard, uh, ever heard uh, Henry Butler play? I know he's passed away now, but he's, uh, man, it's amazing. I, I don't know, how would you describe it, man? It's like playing with a hurricane or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was and intense. So much intensity. Yeah, totally. uh, it's kind of like, maybe like int intensity on the level of like, uh, maybe like McCoy Tyner. Yeah. I remember first time I ever saw McCoy Tyner um, was at Rosie's, which was oh, a jazz well, club in yeah. New Orleans. <laughs> uh, one really great jazz club that was bringing in national acts. I saw McCoy play and, uh, that's the first time I ever heard a piano distort, <laughs> like a guitar amp. I mean, he was playing the piano so hard yeah. that it just physically distorted the sound. And it was just, I don't know, I hate to think of what the piano was like after that. It was over. But Henry had a kind of intensity yeah, too about, about, about yeah. his playing, you know, his rhythm and stuff. You know, it's yeah. amazing. You know. Hey, can I ask a question about sure. the, you talk about polyrhythms. Um, when you learn three against two or three against four, it's not too hard to learn because you can use the triplets. That's right. And subdivide them. How do you learn, you know, five against four and seven against four? It's not as easy with dividing the triplets. Well, I look at it from that point. When, when you're dealing with five and uh, seven and those kind of odd meters, <laughs> I don't. I, I stop counting. Mm -hmm. I just feel it because you notice. You all. You can begin to notice that if you. I mean, you recognize what the rhythm is and you see what it is. But if you know, as you count it. You understand and see that it's uh, you know a seven or high meter. But once you kind of back away and just internalize the rhythm, it becomes much easier to feel as opposed to uh, trying to count. It. Because if you listen closely, you can tell cats, and you can tell if they're playing with a natural feel or even though they sound good, they counting their butt off because they're trying not to get off the beat. And you can hear it some some mild tentativeness with their approach to the uh, to the solo, but if you if you just feel in the rhythm, this is easy at four four. So I would just work on feeling uh, rather than just trying to you know count every single bar because it's, it's it's a lot easier than you think. But I wasn't really talking about five four time signature, mm -hmm. more like five beats against four beats in one bar. You know? Well, that's more like uh, when, when you talking about the stretching of the time. Uh, maybe we can demonstrate that. Uh, say if you've got uh, a nice uh, four, four swing. Pick a key. Uh, okay, just do something. Yeah, one. Two, yeah, that's fine. One, two, one, two, three. Yeah, that's right. One, Up more easily when you're doing five four, but even when, when you're doing it in four four, a lot of times you can do that two three or three two subdivision that'll kind of get you through that uh, get you through that four four measure. Yeah. You got anything to add? To um, that? a little story. When I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school, uh, University of California San Diego, and there was a man named John Charles Francois who was uh, the percussion over the percussion department there, and he made me do crazy things. I mean, people thought I was crazy walking down the street. What you're asking, I, like I said, I would walk down the street, say, man, I'm trying to play like five and fives against four. I'd be walking one, one. I'd walk down the street playing five against four, and as I walked in four, but you know what? Because I was doing that and actually doing something I do every day, that's when it became natural for me. Instead of me sitting in a room, and trying to practice that. Yes, there's theory about that, but that's one thing. But you have to get it in you. you have to, it has to be in you. You have to feel it with anything with music, right? 
I would walk down the street, I'm serious, and I would sing polyrhythms as I'm walking in four. And that helped me because it was something that I did every day without thinking, you know? And I thought, I'm sure people looking at me thinking, oh, what's wrong with that dude, you know? But that, you know, that, that would be maybe a way to internalize that mm -hmm. and get it in you, you know? Yeah, also, if you, you know, you're thinking more in a melodic sense too. So, I mean, you know, uh, how do you hear melodies that might be phrases of five or whatever, you know? So, if you want to work on that, the best, I think the best thing to do is just to program it into your computer. Like, you know, have, have a pulse in four and then pr program uh, a grouping of five on top, of that, on top of that so you hear what it sounds like in four four and then see if you can imagine putting notes to those, to those groupings of five, you know? Um, I don't know, that's a, you know, you got to get it in your ear, right, before you can think in terms of like trying to play it and, you know, because I, I mean, me personally, I don't think that way when I play. I don't think, hey, I'm going to play something in five now or something. Like, you know, it just, it just if, I heard, if, if it sounds like something I've heard before, if it sounds uh, natural to play it, then I'll do it, you know, but I, I don't really think consciously about doing those kind of things. You know? that, that answers you a little bit? Yeah. Cool, man. Any other questions? You know, speaking of five, uh, we, we actually have a little something that uh, uh, lends itself to that kind of discussion. And uh, it's kind of one of those things that we talked about, or uh, the, the idea of taking a standard and kind of switching things up and changing it ever so slightly. Uh, so take five is obviously one of the most uh, renowned jazz standards of all time. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll play a little, just a little blurb of the original, uh, or original piece as it is. And then we'll kind of show you what we did with it in terms of not necessarily changing the rhythm or the time signature, but changing the feel and having, you know, a little fun with the reharmonization along with the feel to make it a little bit more contemporary. So here's the original. Thank you. 
change the time signature, we just change the groove a little bit. So all kind of things you can do as far as creating different um, ways to uh, uh, play musical. You know? So just a little example of that. Yeah. Um, so we have these calls here. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, Mr. Mr. Alexander talk a little bit about this and uh, feature, uh, feature some playing on uh, the Comas. Okay. Well, uh, I had the pleasure of, like I said, uh, going everywhere, going anywhere I could, to find out what I could, to learn what I could, put myself in that situation. I was very lucky and blessed to be able to do that. And um, so, like I said, I went to West Africa for a semester and hung out in the village with master drummers and all kinds of stuff because I wanted to go to the source of a lot of the things that I play or that I've learned, I wanted to go and go where it was born, basically, right? Then after I went to West Africa, the next year, I went to Cuba, right? Because as we know, a lot of the things that they play in Cuba, Puerto Rico, all these places came from the West African slaves, right? And so what started to happen, I started learning chants and rhythms and whatnot. And when I went to Cuba, the older percussionists and I would start playing, they would ask me, how do you know that, right? Because in Cuba is one of, one of those places where the oral tradition has been carried down and carried down and carried down and some of it hasn't changed. There are places where they play and chant and sing exactly the way their ancestors did in West Africa, right? So it was a great experience for me um, to learn the old and new and what it transformed into. So I spent a lot of time um, learning these instruments and what things mean, right? When you play, you should know why people play what they play. What's, what's the history behind it, right? Um, so uh, to make a long story short, I'll talk about playing kumbas. Um, and basically, uh, three drums, Sometimes they play with five or six, but they want to get melody, they want to get all kinds of things, right? Typically, what you see one person playing with three or four drums usually is three or four people playing the parts, the dancers, right? 
and there's a high drum basically called the kinkto, uh, middle drum the conga, large drum called the tumba, right? And basically the tumba, and like in places like Cuba and whatnot, they didn't have drum companies and whatnot, right? So they would make drums and kungas out of a rum barrel, right? And the tumba actually came out of a rum barrel. They started playing on a big giant rum barrel, right? And uh, uh, so there were certain things that they would play. Uh, well, this is something like a tumba, right? That's, that's sort of, a they would play that on a low drum, right? On the high drum, when you'd see them playing with dancers, the high, the person playing the high drum is pretty much improvising and playing to the dancer that's out in front of him or her, right? Playing to their feet and whatnot. So a lot of times you hear all that soloing going on the high drum. Um, middle drum usually was the basic heartbeat and whatnot. So what cats started doing, they started mixing those things together and one person playing some of those rhythms, right? Um, of course, we talked about the clave before. Uh, in Cuba, there's three, two, or two, three, right? It can be based on both those mathematical cells, but there's something called son cla uh, rumba clave and son clave. Son clave is, uh, it's two, three, right? Or three, two, right? Rumba clave, you're anticipating the three side of the beat. So if it's two, three, rumba clave, it's or three, two, rumba clave. Right? So any, when you hear Afro-Cuban music, it is, it is being based off that key, that clave, in either form, uh, in either two, three, or three, two, right? Um, more modern music that they play, they probably they play a little faster, they play more based on the rumba clave, right? Um, so I think that whenever I'm playing, now within a song, we were talking about earlier, I mentioned that sometimes on the stage, cats start getting arguments because they can't, they, they're arguing where the clave should be, right? Because sometimes it might start out two and three and then it could change, right? It could change in the middle of the tune, you know? But uh, typically where you start out is where it is. Um, so there is a rhythm, a basic rhythm that comes from Africa, one, one code, right? Heard that. That's the most popular conga rhythm in the world. You hear it in pop music, you hear it in anything, right? Well, a lot of the rumba clave comes off that. Right? Okay. So what we're gonna get ready and play, the rhythm I'm gonna play is based off of Rumba clave and it's based off of one with code, right? With all this little stuff in between, okay? So, okay. Terry, you think? Sure.
It's a song that he wrote. It's a contrafact on uh, Cherokee called Cochise. Mm. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real tongue twister for some yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so the last presentation we got for you today uh, from the percussion family is Tenor Steel. All right. So I'm not sure how many of you know the history of Tan or Steel Drum. So my first job. Uh, great music job was here in New Orleans, the United States Navy Steel Drum Band, back in 1990. Uh, the band was formed by the great Ellen Manette, who was the father of the steel drum, in 1957 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And then that band in 1970 was moved here to New Orleans, right? And uh, so my first job, great job, was playing steel drum all over the world. That was my gig, right? Mm -hmm. And that came from when I was at Oberlin. I picked up steel drum, because we had a steel drum band at Oberlin as well, right? So I touched anything I could, everything I could, right? And because I did that, it enhanced my employment, <laughs> right? So I could go many different places to work as a musician or work as a drummer or a percussionist. But that's just me, that's not for everyone. But uh, this started my career. This song is right here is called the lead pan or the lead tenor. I have 32 notes. Pretty much about two and a half octaves starting on middle C. Um, and in the steel drum family, there's the lead tenor. There are two drums, a little longer skirt, called lead, uh, double leads. They play the melody along with the lead tenor, but they play the melody an octave lower than this. Then there's something called double seconds. And all they do is chord. They play with four mallets, uh, they chord. Then they have another drum about this long three drums and they're called the guitar pans or the guitar pans. They play nothing but chords. And then in the back row we have the big giant barrel and we have what's called six barrel bass. There are six drums, three notes on each drum. You have a uh, primary note, uh, the fifth and the octave, right? And so he has six drums. Um, then there's uh, the, the um, tenor basses. He has four drums. And he plays the bass line actually an octave above the big double barrel basses, right? So that basically makes up a steel band. And they can play anything, any orchestral piece, any anything, right? When you go to Trinidad, because this, this, this art form was created in Trinidad, right? Um, they have, uh, during Fe February, during Carnival, they have big steel band competitions. The bands are 100 piece bands. They have a competition where they play a classical piece and then they play what we call like a, a calypso, a soca piece, big, and the songs are like 15 minutes long, but with the most um, impressive passages and whatnot, and they learn by rote, they learn by ear, they don't read. So they're kids, they're all, and they're playing these wonderful lines. But that's sort of the history of the drum. Um, I, when I took up this drum, I wanted to start playing, you know, I'm saying, okay, it's cool, that's cool, but I wanted to start playing with rhythm sections. So there are some steel drummers around the country that are doing that. Uh, Manny Mothello, uh, who played with Jaco Pastorius, uh, everybody, he's sort of our, our mentor in the steel drum world, uh, playing bop on pan and whatnot. But uh, anyway, this is the, uh, the lead pan. Um, and I can play melody and I can play Chords typically uh, three mallet, uh, three note chords. Uh. Imagine that with a whole band, right? Um, and then basically, sometimes when I play by myself, I do that, but with a group, I typically don't, but mostly, you know, I'm gonna play melody, right? Now, like I said, I have from middle C, I have a full two octaves. Now, there's some notes and some keys, I don't have that many notes. So pretty much the, the favorite keys for pan is usually C, F, B flat, uh, D, or E major, right? Or E flat major, okay? Um, because we have more notes, right? Um, so, uh, for, anybody have any questions about this before we play? Uh, 
Is that like a guitar piano? You practice scales and stuff? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can play anything, pretty much anybody else does. Right? You know. Are you downstroke? I can't see your hands. Well, typically, like because of the, the nature of the drum, yeah. you don't want to hammer because you get a distorted sound. So I play with what we would call, in Tiffany world, French grip, oh. right? Uh, right? I, uh, and you get more of a, a metal, mellower sound on the steel. Right, and every drum is is tuned based off of harmonics. Of you hear that? You can hear the harmonics, right? So when he tunes his drum, he's actually not he has a tuner, but he knows it's in tune by the harmonics that it rings. You know, so if you play too hard, you can actually knock a note out of tune, right? So that's why your touch has to be a little light. So you're not sort of doing like a stick, like playing drums. You're more a delicate. Type of thing like yeah. that, the fingers, you know. Oh man! So we're gonna uh, uh, end this uh, time together with a demonstration on the uh, steel pan with the uh, jazz favorite, Saint Thomas.
actually, uh, if y'all happen to be going up to Baton Rouge tomorrow, we'll be playing at the Coral Hall uh, tomorrow night. So if you want to take the ride up there, hang out with us at uh, 7.30. Yeah. And uh, how about for Steve Bazikowski? Hey. Oh, yeah. Donald Ramsey on the beach. Yeah. And our special guest this evening, Mr. Leon Alexander. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.